So this is our second of about two and a half lectures on chemical and phase equilibrium. The emphasis so far has just been on chemical equilibrium. Um, we have been introduced to the notion of a reversible reaction, uh, not an irreversible chemical reaction like combustion that's highly irreversible, but a reversible one such that if you change the pressure, you change the temperature, it can shift back and forth between, let's say, what's on the left-hand side, reactants, and what's on the right-hand side, products, it can go back and forth in the equilibrium balance. Make it hotter, make it temperature go up, maybe you get more on the right-hand side, more products. So the way they uh, introduced that notation with this double harpoon arrow over top of an arrow, like this, meaning, hey, that's different than this. This is an indication that it's a reversible reaction. And they have a generic A, B, possibly getting C and D. And then we looked at a number of those reactions. And the stoichiometric coefficients are to make sure that whatever the entities are, the oxygen, the nitrogen, the hydrogen, the carbon, are balanced, are balanced in that reaction equation. All right, so those are the stoichiometric coefficients. Then we didn't come out with and derive this, and I'm only going to give you a very fast derivation of this equation for the equilibrium constant and giving you the equilibrium composition described in mole fractions or in amounts, either Y's or N's. These are the same equations. They're only valid for ideal gas. We're only considering ideal gas uh, mixtures in equilibrium. And you can see a number of things in here. The pressure can take and affect the equilibrium composition. Um, it's, but it only affects it if the sum of these stoichiometric coefficients is not zero. If it's zero, the pressure doesn't affect it. OK. And then how does temperature affect it? Well, this K, this equilibrium constant, is a function of temperature. And we find that equilibrium constant in our table A27 in our textbook as a function of temperature for different uh, reactions, which are basically disassociation reactions. Those are reversible reactions. Notice that these numbers in here are, to get the K, you need to take 10 to the power of that number. So for example, this would be 10 to the minus 22.886. Very, very small number. Last time we set up and solved uh, this equation and we got to something where we had to find the solution to this equation looking for Z. And Z was the amount of carbon monoxide in the final equilibrium mixture. And a number of you were able to pull out your calculators and solve that equation within the, what, 10 minutes that I gave you and then show it to me. And I wrote your names down. Um, all of you should be able to set it up and solve this type of problem on the final exam. You asked about, hey, what's going to be on the final exam? Uh, I can't guarantee it, but it's like 90% plus that you'll do something like that. So you should know your calculator very well. And I posted up um, before, back in 2014, a couple lectures when I covered chemical equilibrium. I talk about uh, one of the students named Jeffrey. You may know him. He's still around here. Um, he's in graduate school. Uh, just found the online program where it records all your keystrokes, and then you can put that file up. And uh, actually, we solved that same problem using the comp calculator. What does that say? TI-30? It's a TI-30. And then another student, uh, Song, he did it in fewer keystrokes, I believe, on the same calculator. So there's more than one way to solve it, on, even on the same calculator. And then previously, I had a student, to, I don't remember his name, sorry, um, show it on a TI-36. He made this little file showing steps. So what I can do is go over to this PDF. And uh, step one, he even uses his pencil, you know, shows where to click. And he typed it up nicely. And I guess he took pictures with his cell phone and inlaid it. And it was three pages. And uh, this is uploaded on Blackboard Learn for you to look at. 
as well as another student did it. And he just took one photo, but he has a nice, uh, you can see he wrote it out on an engineering pad, how to solve this problem. This is not from Thermo. Can you tell what class I was teaching? Can you see that equation? 0.65 equal to hyperbolic tangent of ML divided by something ML. Any class? Ring a bell? Heat transfer. Absolutely. Fin design. So if you're not in heat transfer, you should be soon. And I like this one because he wrote it up nice in steps, and he even put a little debugging step. Hey, did you get an error? You know, look at this. And a little good luck. So those are out there to help you. Now, nobody's done one for a Casio for me yet. And I uh, threw out the challenge to the 9 o'clock. Hey, can you do one for a Casio? A couple students raised their hand and said, yeah, I'll do it. I said, good, I'll write your name down and I'll think about you when I cut final grades. Okay? If you're real close, borderline. I'll do the same thing here. Who uses a Casio? One, two. You can do something like that. And I'll think of you when I cut final grades, okay? If you're borderline, right in there, no problem. Bump you up over. Okay? So anybody going to do it for the Casio? Unfortunately, I've got the TI-30 and 36 covered. And then there's one other calculator that you can use on these exams. It's called uh, HP, but almost nobody uses it. Anybody use the HP 35 something? Well, if you did, there you go. Somebody else could do it. But So do that. Uh, be creative. You know, this is a style here. That's another style that I showed over here. I like both of them. There were other styles that people did and contributed. But as uh, long as a student can find your work helpful, if they had a Casio, didn't know how to set it up and solve, can they read that and really learn how to do it? Well, let's press forward. Now we need to talk about how to get that equation for the equilibrium, where we had the equilibrium constant, then we had the rest of it on the mole fractions or amounts in, in the final equilibrium composition. Well, it has to go back to um, basically the derivation in detail we really don't have time for. I'm going to give you a, a summary of it. But you, you bet most people or most textbooks will introduce the property of the Gibbs free energy. That property is heavily discussed in chemistry classes. But I don't know how far you went in your chemistry class. But it's just another thermodynamic property. It's named after Josiah Willard Gibbs, who coined it or introduced it in 1876. That's been a while, hasn't it? And it predicts when a process will occur spontaneously at constant pressure temperature. It's either defined G is equal to H minus TS, or the, the, a lot of people write it as a change in G, and then they need that to be equal to zero. The change in G is equal to zero at equilibrium. So it'll be the change in H minus T, the constant temperature, times the change in entropy. So you can see it's, it's very similar to a previous property we introduced at the beginning of the semester. What new property were you introduced to at the beginning of this semester? Exergy. Doesn't it look a lot like exergy? Sure. What was the exergy? We had enthalpy for the flow exergy. What was it? Plus or minus T S I know we had H minus H naught and then S minus S naught, but it looks a lot like that uh, flow exergy. Okay. Now, it uh, has two things that a lot of people will say when they introduce Gibbs free energy. One is it's a measure of the maximum non-expansion work for a process at constant temperature and pressure. Very similar to exergy. This non-expansion work means it's useful work. If you're just expanding and pushing back the atmosphere, that's not useful. That's what we said was not useful uh, in exergy. And so that's subtracted. I've had and discussed that derivation before, but I'm not going to cover it this semester. I'm just going to say what we really want for this is that delta G, the Gibbs free energy or change in free energy, is equal to zero at equilibrium. 
chemical equilibrium for chemical compositions. Well, who is this Josiah Willard Gibbs? These are the years he lived. So can you figure out how long he lived? How old was he when he died? Around 64? About the age of my mother when she passed. So, yeah, you wish he lived a lot longer, don't you? Or some sometime, sometimes. Well, in 1863, he earned the first American doctorate in engineering. It's about the fifth American doctorate awarded, but it was the first in engineering. All right, what was happening in the United States, 1863? A bloodbath right? Some of the bloodiest years in, in American history, right? In the smack dab in the black uh, parts of the uh, Civil War, you know, the dark years. It wasn't very, who knew which way it would go in 63. It was not a assured outcome. You could lose a thousand people in a few hours in a battle. A few thousand people would be killed or wounded in a few hours of battle. Okay. Anyway, he was at Yale. That's where he earned it. Later, he left and did some things for just a few years, but he returned to Yale for the remainder of his career, basically the bulk of his career. He was a professor of mathematical physics at Yale University. These are the years he was there, till, basically until his death. And he was praised by Albert Einstein as the greatest mind in American history. That's high praise from somebody who is well known. Uh, this here is a uh, photograph of a... Uh, plaster like um, made with clay. Um, it was made by James Clerk Maxwell. Probably a few of you recognize that name in science and engineering. He lived uh, 1831 to 79. He was a contemporary of Gibbs, true. And he actually made, uh, he read a paper of Gibbs written on thermodynamic properties and he then molded two little clay models, one he kept, one he sent to Yale to give to his friend Gibbs. And Gibbs had it. Story goes that the students at Yale heard that they had gotten this model from, the, from Maxwell. And uh, nobody knew that um, Gibbs was well known. He wasn't known at all. He was very meek, kind of quiet guy, never married, uh, just very nonchalant. I heard he wasn't in the news, not in newspapers, in the books. He wasn't a great lecturer, but he just was a great researcher. Anyway, student went up to him, the story goes, and said, I heard you got this. Yeah, can I see it? Yes. Where'd you get it from? Oh, a friend in England. Who's your friend in England? Oh, just a friend in England. He wouldn't even tell him who it was. <laughs> but the student knew it was from Maxwell. Everybody knew. So anyway, here's some more. Uh, there's a book, uh, American Genius. I forget. I didn't cut down, write down the years it was written. Here's the author. And uh, it says that in here, it says, the only one man lived who could understand Gibbs' papers was Maxwell. And, then, and that was Maxwell, and now he's dead. Because unfortunately, Maxwell died before Gibbs died. So I think he lived even shorter. So uh, that's high praise. Uh, not too long ago, what, 11 years ago, 20 Oh five, the U.S. Postage Service put out commemorative stamps. Hey, I think that's kind of, you make it in life if, or after you're dead. If you make it to a postage stamp, that's something big. Also, this is another thing that seems to be, you know, if, if somewhere your burial place is marked on the Internet, I would say you made it in life somehow. Now, I know that there's a lot of sites you can look up your relatives that have died and find plots, but and then you'll find people have taken visited your gravesite, taken pictures of your thing, and there you go. So there's a picture of his um, tombstone in uh, New Haven, Connecticut, Yale, close to Yale. There's more that could be said about this individual, um, but let's leave it alone and press forward. What we're going to be interested in is the Gibbs energy, also abbreviated that delta G is the chemical potential that is minimized when a system reaches equilibrium at constant pressure and temperature. For a fixed pressure and a fixed temperature, you let it sit there, it'll come to an equilibrium. You change the pressure you ch or you change the temperature, it'll go to another set of, of conditions for a new equilibrium state. 
But for a given constant pressure and temperature, the system will go to an equilibrium state. Well, this is the derivation, and I feel bad because it's near the end of the semester, but this you should be able to understand because it's very similar to some other derivations that we had because we're combining an energy balance with an entropy balance. We've seen that, where you combine both of them. And when you combine them, you'll have some condition that for all real processes, entropy generation is greater than zero. I'm doing this very fast to give you a feeling for it. You introduce a new function. It looks like a convenient grouping of terms. And then you say for a system that's no longer changing pressure, no longer changing temperature, but uh, is going to be going to equilibrium, that that change is greater than or equal to zero, or it's equal to zero at equilibrium, such that if you're a little bit on this side, it's going to move in that direction to equilibrium, and G is going to go down. Or if you're on this side, G is higher, then it'll go move toward equilibrium. This illustration is in the textbook as well for fixed temperature and pressure. Well, it begs the introduction of the chemical potential, which I don't think is worth a whole lot of our time, but the chemical potential is the rate of change of G that gives energy with respect to the amount at that temperature and pressure in that mixture. All right, so the equilibrium condition, let me see if I can summarize this. We have it all on a molar basis for these Gibbs uh, property and ideal gases. We're only doing equilibrium composition of ideal gases, right? We're not doing solutions. But yes, the chemists have worked it out for solutions. The general equation, and so if you have some forward reaction, it's going to reduce the amount of A and reduce the amount of B, but it'll increase the amount of C and increase the amount of D. Th through the stoichiometric coefficients, they're all equal. You then can combine to get a, I'm gonna just skip this, combine to collect terms where you're collecting terms which are a function of temperature on one side, and then a function not of temperature on the other side. And then this is what you get. So they introduced the log of the equilibrium constant. That's a natural log. is equal to minus delta G naught divided by R bar T. That's the change in the Gibbs function at that reference pressure. Um, and you can see it's a function of temperature equal to the natural log, et cetera. Take the exponential of both sides. You get the K is equal to, and that's what we wanted to get. And then... Uh, what is Y? Y is the amount. Let's say Y sub C is amount C divided by the N total. And then it's a very easy algebra to go there. This was probably the best form for you to use. Okay. Isn't that the one we set up and solved last time? All right. Sorry if you feel cheated, but the derivation, unfortunately, or fortunately, not unfortunately, is in the book. But I just wanted to give you a run through quickly. You could be asked to use the enthalpy of formation da uh, data and absolute entropy data for different constituents, like uh, this is for the carbon. Oops, I just erased that. Uh, let's do edit, undo, undo, edit, undo, edit, undo. All right. Uh, for carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, as well as oxygen. And you could calculate this uh, molar uh, Gibbs uh, energy here at 298 Kelvin. And that standard pressure as well. You can then combine to get the change in the Gibbs energy for the reaction. You use the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the carbon uh, monoxide, the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the oxygen, minus the stoichiometric coefficient in front of the carbon dioxide. You could then uh, um, put this in delta G naught divided by R bar T, calculate the natural log of K is negative 103.82. Then you could exponentiate both sides, calculate what K is. I left that step off. And then even put it as take the um, uh, log base 10 of K, it's negative 45.06. You can actually take this data, which is enthalpy of formation, 
and the absolute entropy data and reproduce what are in the tables. This was done for decomposition of carbon dioxide at 298. So if we go to our disassociation reaction equation, 298 Kelvin, decomposition of carbon dioxide, voila, that's where that number comes from. Interesting, huh? That you can actually get that those values in the tables. So the equilibrium constant is a combination of the first law, conservation of energy, and second law, entropy. And it gets to where it's minimized. Well, what I want to do is leave you enough time so that you can work on a problem. I want you to work on this problem. The 9 o'clock, they weren't do too good. They were like, uh, it's been a long time. So if we have a gaseous mixture that has a molar analysis of 10% carbon monoxide, 80%, I'm sorry, carbon dioxide, 80% carbon monoxide, 10% oxygen, it enter, it's not in anything associated with equilibrium, but it enters a, a heat exchanger and is heated at constant pressure such that it's at 3,000 Kelvin and 3 atm, and it comes out as an equilibrium mixture of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and oxygen at that temperature and pressure. Can you determine the molar analysis of the exiting equilibrium mixture? All right, I want to give you a few seconds. I guess I'll quit tormenting you. All right, so we basically have the equilibrium equation some people wrote that down right away. Hey, we just wrote that equation down, didn't we? And for this problem, you could write that equation down. But before we do that, that's really a conservation of uh, energy and the uh, second law of thermodynamics. It's a combination of those two to get us to the equilibrium condition. But you're going to have something balanced and something balanced. What am I looking for? What's going to balance? Carbon and oxygen. Those are the two players. At the beginning of the system, I think about initial state and final state. Before it comes out of the, the heat exchanger at equilibrium, it's not in equilibrium. But I have so much oxygen and so much carbon. I can't destroy carbon or produce carbon. I can't destroy oxygen or produce oxygen. When it comes out, it's going to have the same amount. So we're going to have an a C balance and an O balance. Okay. What you do is you say, how much did I start with on the carbon balance? And that has to be what I end with. Right? Well, think about it. I'm going to come in with a molar mix just like this. It's not in equilibrium. Never said it was what coming in. So what do we do is we say, okay, if it's going to come in with that Y for the CO2 of 10% and the Y for the CO of 80% and the Y of the O2 is 10%, hey, what is this Y again? I forgot. Mole fraction. We basically assume that N is equal to 1 kilomole. What do you mean by N? The total mixture coming in, you just pick it. It's going to be one kilomole. It's easy to do that. It's like sometimes you pick areas one meter squared. You just, it helps you in your logic. So now I'm going to have 0.1 kilomole of CO2 coming in. I'm going to have 0.8 kilomole of carbon coming in. I'm going to have 0.1 kilomole. Kind of boring that first step, isn't it? But you're your conception moving from Y mole fraction to amounts coming in. You picked one. Now, if that's what's coming in, how much carbon's coming in? Can you tell me that? Well, you're going to have one carbon for every one of those CO2s. So here's 1 times 0.1. That's how much carbon's coming in with the CO2. You're going to have one carbon for every kilomole, but you only have 8, 0.8 kilomoles coming in of the carbon uh, uh, monoxide, and none with the 0.1 on the oxygen. So I can sum that up. It'll be 0.9 kilomoles of carbon coming in. How many kilomoles of carbon have to go out? 
0.9. And there's my equilibrium equation. The out, how do I describe the out? Well, I say, this is how much is coming in, how much is going out. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I need to calculate them. So really, I leave that as a variable. The amount of CO2 coming out, the amount of CO coming out, and the amount of O2 coming out. So I'll say I'll get one for every uh, kilomole of CO2 coming out. I'll have one for every carbon monoxide coming out. But, but these are changed now. These are the equilibrium coming out. Okay, let's finish that equation. Plus nothing times the number of O2. So my first equation from a carbon balance is 0.9 is equal to number in equilibrium of CO2 plus N of CO in equilibrium. Looks too easy. Do it for oxygen. Can you do it for oxygen now? Now that we did it for the, for the carbon, can you do the oxygen balance? Do you want to do it or do you just, Professor, go on. You're on a roll. Go. go. Keep going. Keep going. You got it. You got it. Keep going. Well, we're going to do this. We have 0.1 moles or kilomoles of carbon dioxide coming in. Okay, so I put the 0.1 coming in. How many O's come with each of those kilomoles of CO2? Two. two. You can't forget that two. All right, because it's an oxygen balance, not an O2 balance, an O balance. All right, then we have 0.8 of the CO coming in. How many O's with each CO? One. And then we have 0.1 on the O2's coming in, and we multiply by two. Let's do that math real fast. What do we get? 1.2. Isn't it 1.2? Now we do the same thing on what's going out. Okay, well, we're going to get two for each CO2 going out. Why? Because every carbon dioxide has two oxygen with it. Okay, then we're going to have one times the amount of CO coming out, and we'll have something O2. What's multiplied by the O2? Two. So now you have this equation from the carbon balance, this equation from the oxygen balance, and you write your equilibrium equation. The equilibrium equation is K times the amount of CO raised to the 1 power times the amount of O2 square rooted divided by the amount of CO2 and CO2 raised to the 1 power times the equilibrium pre uh, the, I'm sorry, the actual exit pressure divided by the atmospheric pressure divided by the total N all to the coefficient in front of the carbon monoxide plus the coefficient in front of the other, um, on the right-hand side, the oxygen, minus the coefficient in front of the carbon dioxide. Those are my three equations. Make sense? So, these are the three unknowns. This is my oxygen, uh, carbon balance. This is my oxygen balance expressed in terms of Z. Whoops, Z is the uh, variable used for the amount of carbon monoxide in the equilibrium mixture coming out. I then get one equation. I put those two into this equilibrium equation, and then I have to solve for the root. And I already stressed, you can anticipate needing to be able to solve a problem like this on your final exam. True? All I got to do is change up a little bit, and it's a new problem. So you have to be able to do that. And then you can solve for it. When we solve for Z, we find it's uh, 0.614, blah, 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 meaning it's nearly 68% carbon monoxide coming out, 31% uh, carbon dioxide, and less than 1% going out of oxygen. Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and stop. Thanks for your attention.